Uh, just maybe waiting for maybe two, three minutes for uh, attendees to just uh, gather up and then be stopped. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, should I start my sharing screen and? Uh... Uh, yes, uh, please, uh, Dr. Zaki, please, you can just uh, share it and, uh, until we have, uh, yeah, our attendees are joining. <clears throat> uh, can you see screen now? Or... Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> Well, we'll be starting uh, in four minutes exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm yeah. just do it. Yeah, now in Japan is 11. <laughs> yeah. After 11. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Dr. Zaki Suyani will be holding you for maybe. Uh, Maybe another one hour. No, it is my pleasure to to be here and uh, yeah, yeah. Meet, meet very nice professors. Yeah, from Thank different uh, countries. Yeah.
Oh, sorry, I I was uh, speaking in the mute mode. So, uh, so uh, anyway, so assalamu alaikum everybody and uh, good uh, afternoon maybe to our speakers from UK. We have our uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Peter Clough and Dr. Meming Zhu from uh, UK. Uh, maybe good night for uh, Dr. Zaki Zahran from uh, Nigata University in uh, Japan. Uh, as well, uh, we have Dr. Bassam Abdel Nabi from uh, GE Aerospace in USA, and we may tell him a good morning, Dr. Bassam, and uh, have a good day and night, everybody. So today we, uh, we are welcoming you in this webinar organized by the Interdisciplinary uh, Research Center for Hydrogen and Energy Storage. Uh, this webinar is on clean hydrogen energy for sustainable uh, future. Uh, this webinar is tackling the hydrogen issue in, in the up, from the upstream to the downstream. We have two speakers who will be speaking from in the downstream size in hydrogen mobility and utilization and combustion systems. And then the upstream side, we have uh, two speakers as well. We'll be talking about uh, hydrogen production, uh, green and the blue hydrogen production. Uh, and also, uh, we may hear about the other colors of hydrogen. We may hear about gray hydrogen, uh, turquoise hydrogen, and very recently I heard about white hydrogen, in which we have hydrogen out of uh, wells, like the oil. So hopefully we'll be enjoying this uh, bouquet of hydrogen uh, tonight. Uh, our speaker, we have a special uh, speaker tonight. We have uh, Dr. Zaki Zahran from uh, Niigata University in, in Japan. Who will give us a talk on the cutting electrolysis technology? Uh, we have as well uh, Dr. Peter Clough from uh, Cranfield University, UK, who will give us a talk about absorption enhanced fuel reforming uh, for clean hydrogen production. Uh, this is reforming and uh, as well as uh, carbon dioxide uh, capture. Uh, we have in the downstream, uh, Dr. Uh, Meming Zhou from Cranfield University will give us a talk about uh, ammonia as a carbon-free fuel and hydrogen carrier. Uh, and also we have Dr. Bassam Abdel Navi from uh, GE Aerospace in USA will give us a talk on hydrogen combustion challenges uh, and the future outlook. So without any further uh, delay, because I think we may be delayed maybe four minutes or something, we will be starting with uh, Dr. Uh, Zaki Zahran uh, from uh, Niigata University, Japan, uh, to give us his talk. Uh, Dr. Zaki uh, has his bachelor and master degree in chemistry from Tanta University in Egypt, uh, and he got his uh, PhD from University of, uh, of Oklahoma State in the United States in 2007. Uh, Dr. Zaki is a system professor. He worked as a system professor at uh, Kyushu and uh, Shubu University in uh, Japan. And he is only faculty from uh, Tanta University in Egypt as well. Uh, Dr. Zaki is working mainly on hydrogen production via the electrochemical and uh, photochemical water splitting. So the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Zaki, to go ahead. You have a kind of uh, 25 minutes, please, for your presentation. And uh, this will be followed by maybe five minutes for question and answer. Uh, for our uh, dear audience, uh, please, if you have any question, please write it down in the chat. And we will be just uh, passing it to Dr. Zaki and our speakers also after his presentation. The floor is yours, Dr. Zaki. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace upon you all. So, my name is Zaki Zahran. At Negata University, and I'm also working as a professor in Santa University, Egypt, Faculty of Science. So before I start my talk, I would like to thank the organizer for this nice webinar. Uh, and also I would like to thank the King Fahd University for this invitation. And particularly, I would like to thank uh, Professor Tarek for, his, uh, for, uh, for inviting me for this talk. So I will start first why we need like uh, this water electrolysis, why we need hydrogen. Actually, there is very big problem as you can see this in this figure. So this figure shows the carbon dioxide level in just the uh, last 40 years from 1980 to the, uh, 2020. 
as you can see, the carbon dioxide increase actually in this 40 years from 340 to about 420 parts per million in the atmosphere. And actually, this is very dangerous because this increase represents about 20% in just 40 years. And this means we have now in our planet Earth, uh, the carbon neutrality is broken. Actually, the carbon should be stable, stable like this, but this increase is very problematic. And why it is problem? Because actually carbon dioxide is responsible for about 82% of the global warming. And of course, all of us are familiar now with the global warming. And this caused the temperature of the Earth to increase actually by about 1.1 degree in just uh, uh, if we compare it with pre-industrial age. And this actually 1.1 degree is very huge and uh, all of us now feeling the weather change everywhere in the world. And actually by 2050, by 2050, the temperature is expected to be, uh, to reach two degree increase. And this will be very dangerous for our living on this earth. And actually, last, uh, in the last meeting in Paris, the, the old government uh, gather in Paris and they take action for this. And actually, we have to remove about 10 gigaton of carbon dioxide must be removed every year to, to avoid this problem. And how to do this? Yeah, we have several choices. The first choice is to start using renewable fuel instead of the fossil fuel. Actually, most of the carbon dioxide comes from the fossil fuel. Uh, another way is to just capture and store the carbon dioxide produced and then use it, uh, save it in under ocean or, or, or use it for producing of another uh, valuable material. So here I am showing, so now we need the renewable fuel. So in this figures, I am showing actually the principle of producing new fuel or like hydrogen, we can also produce carbon monoxide, methanol, and we can also produce ammonia in this electrochemical cell. So in this electrochemical cell, you need power source and you need anode or photoanode and you need cathode or photocathode for this setup present in aqueous solution like water because water is sustainable and the yeah, huge amount. And then we need like what is called oxygen evolving catalyst and we need fuel catalyst to produce this. this. And what happened? So the power source will activate your oxygen evolving catalyst to oxidize water to oxygen and the protons and the electrons at the same time. So the electron will go around this from the outer circuit and the hydrogen will go in the solution to combine simultaneously at the cathode or photocathode to produce like hydrogen if we don't have just water or if we have carbon dioxide, we can produce carbon monoxide, methanol, or in other product, or now it is uh, nitrogen, we can produce with this proton, we can produce ammonia. All these are renewable fuel and they should be sustainable. And what is the problem for this setup? Actually, the problem is this water oxidation catalyst. So this anode or photoanode and this cathode or photocathode. So, Till now, the, this anode has very high over potential and this over potential, most of the catalyst is about 300 millivolt. And for the fuel cathode, yeah, for proton, for example, we need about 100 millivolt over potential. But now we reach a three in our lab, yeah, not published yet. But for carbon dioxide, the situation is more problematic and we need over like 600 millivolt. For ammonia is more difficult, more difficult. We have this ammonia is more difficult and it's challenging. And still the current of, uh, of, our, uh, of uh, uh, nowadays, uh, very important subject in this, in this renewable energy. And they want, one of our professors will talk about ammonia in this meeting. So the problem now is the overall cell potential should be equal the theoretical potential plus over potential for oxygen and the plus over potential for hydrogen. 
and this over potential is important because it will increase the cost of this uh, of this uh, of this technology. So next, next, next. Here I'm showing the yeah. I will focus on protein reduction in my talk today. But in our lab, we do all all of this process. So I will focus on protein reduction to produce hydrogen. And here I am showing the most uh, used or reported technology to produce hydrogen from motor electrolysis and using electrochemical method. So the first setup is just alkaline solution electrolyzer. And this setup is uh, yeah, well, well known for a long time ago, but actually the efficiency of this uh, system is not, uh, is not high. So another technique is using what is called the proton electron uh, electron membrane technology. This technology also, this is the high, the most efficient technology now to produce hydrogen. But the problem for this technology, so the cathode and the anode material should be precious metal, like platinum, like uh, rosinium, iridium. So we cannot actually use uh, non-precious metals. And also the membrane is very expensive. So the technology, this technology can produce a lot of hydrogen, but the problem is also very expensive. And the third one, it is called C. It is now, nowadays it is recently uh, reported this alkaline anion exchange membrane. And this actually technology produced also a lot of hydrogen, but not efficient as this one. But in this technology, we can produce hydrogen using like cathode and the anode with non-precious metal, like which will be cheap. Yeah, this technology is, is looks like very simple technology, but you will see in just a few minutes uh, what is the level the world breach in this technology so far. The another way to produce hydrogen is actually solar hydrogen production. So solar hydrogen production, we can divide it here and you can get the detail in this chapter I wrote. So mainly four, four processes you can produce hydrogen by solar. The first one, which is this A, which is called the photocatalytic system. This is very simple and very cheap, but actually the efficiency so far reach like only 5% maximum and is not stable. This is a problem for this technology. The second one, it is the B, this three kind of B, which is called the photoelectrochemical system. And photoelectrochemical system, you need photoanode and the cathode and the sun, you can produce hydrogen. The another one is like anode and the photocathode. The third one is photoanode and the photocathode. Yeah, this way is also efficient, but the problem, the problem is the stability so far is not good. Uh, stability is not good and also efficiency is not high enough. So the third, the third way is to produce by C, this three kind of C. This C is what is called photovoltaic electrolyzer system. Actually, this is the highest, uh, the highest technology that can produce using solar energy. And in this technique, you just use solar cell connected with electrolyzer from, from anode and the cathode. And in different setup like C1, C2, C3, it is the same name by different technology way. So you can have the photovoltaic system modified with anode and the cathode and the put it in solution and you can produce hydrogen and the oxygen in both sides. And this side is like called wired, wired because you are connecting the photovoltaic cell with the anode and the cathode by wire. This one wireless, and uh, this one is also uh, like wire and wireless. You can get it just to modify the photovoltaic with anode and the separate with cast. Or the last uh, technology is to mix this one with this one, solar cell and the photo anode and the photo cast. But I can tell you the maximum efficiency reached by this way. This is the best way now to produce hydrogen by solar energy. The other method is okay, but the stability is not good. But this one very stable and they produce very high efficiency. Actually, the maximum level now reaches 30% conversion of solar energy to hydrogen. So in our group, we are actually interested in all kind of this renewable energy. We are interested like for metal complexes to produce uh, to reduce carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide with like metal complexes like iron, porphyrin, dimer, 
also interest about water oxidation catalyst like rosinium dimer. Yeah, we have, and also interested about photoanode and photocathode, including hematite, bismuth vanadate, tungsten oxide, tantalum nitride, copper bismuth oxide as photocathode. We also interested about this, and also interested about metal oxide as anode for water oxidation, like manganese, and also interested about uh, some com uh, multi component catalyst like iron nickel tungsten. So my talk, I will give this an example. And also we discovered recently very highly efficient catalyst. If I have time, I will talk about this also catalyst. Ah, this is very important, very important slide in my talk actually. Yeah, this will tell you what is the level of this technology right now. Uh, what is, and is the future of this technology. And actually I'm presenting here three kinds of hydrogen. It's like gray hydrogen, blue hydrogen, and the green hydrogen. So gray hydrogen is hydrogen produced from the fossil fuel, like oil, uh, uh, natural gas, uh, coal, or something. And actually this one, this one, the problem is this one, is produce a lot of carbon dioxide during the production because it is produced from methane and the carbon dioxide will come. But I can tell you, this actually, this paper is just published like four months ago in Nature and they're very nice. I recommend all of you to read this one because you can see from this, we are currently only producing hydrogen by fossil fuel. Even this technology, I, I explained it before, it is very, looks very simple, but very cost of the money. So actually, most of the countries spent a lot of time, a lot of money, but actually no improvement so far from this technology. You can see from this slide, from this slide. And why? Because you can see the cost, cost here in this slide. So this is the cost of producing one kilogram of hydrogen uh, using the fossil fuel. So the cost is very low, like from one to about three dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. You can spend if you use fossil fuel. So, but in the future, the people plan to produce green hydrogen, uh, blue hydrogen. This is the only solution now, like uh, because uh, blue hydrogen means they use fossil fuel, but they capture the carbon dioxide produced to save our environment from carbon dioxide. So just using carbon, capture carbon dioxide and utilize it by saving or converting to another material. So still using fossil fuel, but reduce the amount of carbon dioxide produced. This is called the blue hydrogen. In the future, the future the people still using fossil fuel because we cannot move directly to the blue hydrogen or green hydrogen. Green hydrogen, this is, uh, this is comes from electrolysis or electrolysis or solar energy or like wind energy. And as you can see, as I told you so far, we did not achieve any progress in this field. Actually, I, I read in this paper, like Europe country, it's been like 3.3 trillion uh, euros, but no big success in so far, so far. And the main problem is the cost. As you can see, this, for example, this hydrogen, which is green hydrogen, produced from electrolysis using solar photovoltaic cell, and the cost is very high compared with this one. And also the green, the blue hydrogen is, yeah, looks like uh, looks like uh, promising for this technology because the, the little bit increase from the fossil fuel. The increase because actually the cost for uh, for manipulating the produced the carbon uh, dioxide. But even in the future, in the future, like by 250, the people look to reduce the fossil fuel and they produce blue hydrogen and the green hydrogen. And they expect the, the technology will be uh, cheap in the future, but uh, no one knows actually. But uh, what, what, what we can realize now is this, yeah, even we spend a lot of money, but the actual production of blue or green hydrogen is still very low. And the, the main problem is the cost. So this is the main problem. The technology and the science we can produce, but the problem, the cost is very high. You can, you can imagine from this slide. So now I will talk about one of our example to produce this hydrogen uh, 
uh, and the and the development of uh, very efficient anode for oxygen production and the hydrogen production. So in this one, we discover actually a very nice catalyst called iron nickel tungsten catalyst, and we prepare it by a simple way, very simple method. Just to take, for example, the electrode like nickel foam and they put it in solution containing methanol and imidazole, and the imidazole is very important, and then soak it, soak it for just 30 seconds, and we get metal complex in the electrode, and then calcium at 450, we can get very efficient catalysts and very stable, very homogeneously distributed. And in this figure, I'm showing the amount of catalyst. We can control the amount of catalyst in the electrode by just changing the concentration of this precursor. As you can see in the presence of imidazole, the amount of catalyst increase and the rich a saturation level. If we use only methanol, so the catalyst is easily detached from the electrode and it becomes very fragile and we cannot get homogeneous catalyst. And this figure shows the same image uh, mapping for, for this catalyst. As you can see, this is the image. And this is the distribution of iron. This is distribution of nickel. And this is the distribution of tungsten. And this is the distribution of oxygen. It is very nice uh, homogeneous distribution of all material in this catalyst. And then we test this. This method can reveal many, many catalysts. And here I am showing this activity for our catalyst was shown is red, is very high active catalyst actually. And if you compare it with this black one, which is the nickel foam itself is very low activity. And then this catalyst is much better than even iridium oxide, which iridium oxide is shown here. And then iron nickel itself is shown in this blue and like iron itself is shown in green. And even if we prepare the same material by another method, which is hydrothermal, which is shown in this line, magenta rain, you can see very big difference in the activity. And this catalyst actually uh, show very nice kinetic for the oxygen production. And this kinetics comes from the tuffel slope, which is shown here very low. So the low number means good kinetic uh, response for this material. And this catalyst actually we tested for 100 hours and there's an over potential for this catalyst to produce 10 milli and is very low, 170 millivolt only. And actually the oxygen produced from catalyst is about as shown in this red dotted line, which is this is the practical formed and the black one is the theoretical. So the efficiency for this catalyst to produce oxygen is almost 100% selectivity for producing the oxygen. And here I am showing just the the uh, science which shows that the very efficient catalyst in this field in the world so far. This I am choosing the best catalyst. So this uh, are among the best catalysts for this reaction. And you can see our catalyst now is uh, showing 176, which is below. It is one of the best catalysts so far. And the, and the, and the later on, I will talk about another catalyst we develop also, and we have very low over potential for, get, for this catalyst, which is nickel sulfate. I will talk about this one. But now focus on this one is one of among the one of the best catalysts reported so far for oxygen production and the hydrogen production. Then we use this catalyst for like, like we use this technology like a, a solar cell connected with electrolyzer to produce hydrogen. So we used our catalyst, new catalyst as anode, and the, till now we use platinum as cathode. And here is the schematic presentation of our cell. And this is the actual cell. So this is actually is the solar cell, which is shown here. And also this is our electrolyzer, and this is a computer to record our data. But before I started this technology, because this is the most developed technology and the most trusted one, most highly efficient technology to produce hydrogen using the solar energy. But there is principle because now we have solar cell and we have electrolyzer. So this is the principle of this technology. Yeah, we, we already published this principle uh, for this technology. So the principle, the green line is the solar cell the the iv curve of the solar cell and the red one is the current potential curve for the electrolyzer so this this cut this intersection point is the operating for this system 
So, so the solar cell should have like efficiency, should have efficiency, which is the is multiply multiplication of V maximum, this V maximum and the current, this, this triangle. And the red one is for the electrolyzer. So we call this matching factor between the solar cell and the electrolyzer. So Does this matching be? factor, yes, yeah, but please, in uh, maybe two, three minutes uh, to wrap up, to conclude with the uh, presentation. Five, 15, 15. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank now you. Five, 10, 15, 20. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this is, this is, uh, this is what, what is called the uh, electrolyzer. Okay, so this is matching factor is low. So the best condition you have to have matching factor 100%. So this is very important to design this technology. This another technology, this another principle, but the matching factor is low. So the, this is the most important, this is the principle of this technology. And this is our actual results for this, the most important for this. So we have solar cell designed in our lab uh, to match the electrolyzer perfectly and the matching factor is 100 percent and actually we achieved the solar to hydrogen efficiency about 14 percent this is actually very high level very high record in this one and we tested this one for one month actually one month there is no decrease in the activity as you can see the current is stable for all the time for this is for 70 hours and we tested one month and the electrolyzer potential is very 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 good uh, this means very high activity for this system yeah yeah next we we develop like another catalyst which is nickel uh, sulfate carbon nitride and this is very nano wire like this very nano wire set up and we can see this material consists of nickel sulfide and the and the covered with carbon nitride carbon nitride chill to protect this material uh, this is the XRD shows that the carbon material form in this material in this compound with nickel sulfide. And the next, this is the distribution of this material mapping. Yeah, very nice distribution of this material as non wire. The most important is the activity for this material is actually the over potential is less than 30 millivolt, 30 millivolt. And this is published in Energy and Environmental Science. And the oxygen produced in like 100% uh, Faradic efficiency. And this is, we compare it with other material, like for example, iridium, very high activity, this material. And the kinetic of this material, because I explained before, is also very high. And then we connected with like platinum cathode, and we can get overall water splitting with very low over potential actually, with oxygen and the hydrogen produced in like two to one ratio in this figure. And we, 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 we understand that what happens this material, so nickel sulfate from different experiment, this nickel sulfate, very good connector to the material. On the surface, it changes to nickel oxide and the nickel sulfate is good connector. So the electron transfer very easy and the, and the carbon nitrate is very essential for this to protect this material. And this is actually the figure I showed before. So we develop this catalyst blue and this is red one now, which I just explained very high activity. And the, uh, this one shows the uh, oxygen production. Yeah, uh, this movie, but we can see oxygen and the hydrogen was just like, like battery. Yeah, just like battery, this yeah, just a few minutes. Yeah, just to oxygen produced and the hydrogen produced others uh, was just using the battery, not electricity, just, just using this battery. Okay. Just using, as you can see, just using uh, this battery, we can produce hydrogen, split water to hydrogen and oxygen with this because this is very efficient catalyst. Yeah, and uh, finally, I would like uh, to thank all my groups. Uh, this is my groups, so all of us, I uh, am here. And this is actually the supervisor and I am the second person in this group. And this is from our activity. Yeah, this is the supervisor and I am here. And yeah, thank you for your intention, attention. Thanks, and if Dr. you have Zaki. any questions. Thank you, Dr. Zakir, for the insightful talk on uh, the hydrogen production through electrolysis. However, it was not limited to electrolysis. I think you have already covered uh, uh, most of uh, the green hydrogen production, as well as you reflected on uh, blue hydrogen, as well as gray hydrogen. 
So hydrogen have nice colors. So uh, we have here a question from uh, Dr. Hassan Ali from uh, Kifu Bemi. Uh, talks about how about the cost of this uh, electro uh, electrocatalyst material uh, because the price of uh, green hydrogen mainly depending upon the cost of anode and cathode. So just what about the cost of those electrocatalysts? Yeah, electrocatalyst in our, as you can see, we develop nickel sulfide. This material carbon nitride, this material is abundant, not like precious metal. So the catalyst is very cheap, very cheap. Actually, the, the most expensive part in this electrolysis is actually this one. If you look at this, uh, this one, uh, the catalyst itself is very cheap, but the, the problem now is this membrane. This membrane now is very high cost, you can imagine. But uh, anyway, the catalyst is very cheap, especially our catalyst is not precious. It's like nickel abundant and also like iron nickel tungsten, very common. So the catalyst is very cheap. Yeah, that's uh, very promising. So uh, I think in your uh, slide number eight, maybe I have this uh, just need to hear from you or otherwise our uh, dear friend, Dr. Peter will be answering this question. So you talk, you really reflected her on uh, green, blue, and gray hydrogen, um, this very recent uh, publication in Nature. So what about uh, something, is there anything reported about the mixed technologies like absorption enhanced steam methane reforming or any other reforming of any feed stock uh, in which we combine reforming and uh, also uh, uh, reforming and the carbon dioxide capture in, in the same technology so that we can reduce the cost of uh, blue hydrogen production by this uh, combined technology. So I think as we talk about bifunctional materials that act as catalyst and act as uh, as well as absorbent for the material in this case. So any reports on, on such uh, combined technologies? Yeah, if, if you yeah, if you look at this, it actually this describe what you are talking about this blue hydrogen. So this blue hydrogen, yeah, uh, material to act as catalyst and then capturing the CO two. I think is this is very difficult. But uh, uh, and yeah. actually, I don't know. I don't know actually yeah. if there is. Mm. Thank you, Professor Zaki, for your insightful talk. So we'll be uh, crossing uh, this. Uh, this will be the link between the two presentation. I think maybe Dr. Peter Clough may have an uh, answer to this. So, I can certainly talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have our uh, dear friend there. We have uh, Dr. Peter Clough from uh, Cranfield University, which is the industry leading university uh, when it comes to the, in, uh, the collaboration with the industry. She is a, it is a world leading university. As a matter of fact, Dr. Vitar is a senior lecturer in energy engineering and uh, in energy and energy engineering at Cranfield University, and he is mainly specialized in uh, hydrogen production, uh, clean hydrogen production, we can say, as well as uh, carbon dioxide capture. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Peter have received his uh, master degree from the University of uh, Nottingham uh, in UK, and then his PhD uh, from Imperial College London uh, on the topic of absorption enhanced steam methane reforming and gasification of biomass for uh, clean hydrogen production. Uh, Dr. Clough is associate member of uh, the Institute of Chemical Engineers and associate fellow of the Higher Education Association and is the research focus on uh, blue hydrogen, clean hydrogen production, let's say, carbon capture, restorage, uh, capture, carbon capture and storage, and the catalytic and non-catalytic material development and testing. Uh, so the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Peter, with a kind of uh, 20 to 25 minutes and uh, followed by five minutes for question and answer. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. And firstly, thank you very much for um, inviting me onto this um, this um, event. So I've just started sharing my screen. <laughs> if you can't see it, let me know. But yeah. um, hopefully we can go. Exactly. So, uh, thank you. So um, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Peter Clough. Um, I am from Cranford University and I'm one of the academics here. My focus is on clean hydrogen production or really blue hydrogen production, but the, the definitions of colors um, I will come on to later. And this talk is all about the a project called Hyper um, that we're doing at Cranfield University. So, click, there we go. So at the moment, um, we've had a, 
already an introduction to hydrogen already, so I don't need to go too much into this. But most hydrogen in the world is produced from fossil fuels, and it's highly likely that will change in the future. Um, so we are already expecting um, that the demand for hydrogen will increase over time. It has increased at 5% every single year for the last 100 years or so. Um, but we're expecting that by 2050, the demand for hydrogen will be six times greater than what it currently is. So there's a space for hydrogen in lots of areas and a space for different production methods. Um, at the moment, most hydrogen is produced for refining ammonia and methanol production, but that's likely to change as different hydrogen users come online. And putting into perspective for the UK at least, there is a, an overall target that by 2030, we will have 10 gigawatt of clean hydrogen production. And the UK has gone down the line of saying we want clean hydrogen, not a specific color. Although they have said they want 50% green um, by 2050, uh, 2030, sorry. Um, now we're, we're making progress towards this. There is already some big projects coming online and only last week, there was 20 billion pounds allocated by the UK government for carbon capture and storage to enable part of this hydrogen production. And in the UK, we're again predicting a very high demand increase for hydrogen production as we utilize hydrogen for decarbonization of our industry. Now, there are lots of different applications of hydrogen and there is a person called Michael Liebrich who has invented this hydrogen ladder. And overall, what it tends to show is that some applications of hydrogen are absolutely required. You can't get around it because the chemistry just requires hydrogen. But there are other applications of hydrogen where you could do it. You definitely could make a hydrogen fuel cell car, but it might not make sense to do so because infrastructure is already out there for electric cars. And we can argue about the individual locations of each one of these, but it shows the general trend that if you are a bigger industry or a bigger vehicle or a bigger demand of hydrogen or bigger demand of energy, then it's more likely you will shift towards hydrogen in the future. But if you're a smaller energy user, then it's likely you'll go towards electricity. So to do all of that, we need to build some new technology and there are different options. We could go for coal fired um, hydrogen production and that's quite cheap it's very old it's been done for a long time but the co2 emissions are terrible and it's the same really for gray hydrogen production which it comes from natural gas but you could do a new form of this where you take natural gas steam methane reforming and you capture the co2 emissions and that would be called a blue hydrogen production method it's a bit more expensive it's a bit newer but co2 emissions are much better you could also do a green hydrogen production method, which tends to cost a bit more, but um, it's advancing very quickly. And this is more like a, a young middle aged person or a hipster, as we're calling the UK, um, and tends to be the CO2 emissions are much better. And you can go to pink hydrogen production or even turquoise hydrogen production. But really, in if we're looking at this in terms of emojis, where you have a coal power station that's been around and that's an old grandpa, and you have brand new technologies like methane pyrolysis, which are babies in this sense, then we have no idea how good these will actually turn out to be in the future. So we've definitely got to keep, keep developing these technologies, but we can't wait for the investment now. We've got to make the investments based on what we know. So at Cranfield University, we are delivering that. We are actively working on the production of hydrogen. We're looking at the transportation, the movement, the supply chains. We're looking at fuel cell vehicles, internal combustion vehicles, gas turbines. And because we have an airport, we're also heavily involved in aviation and we're covering all of the, the value chain. And Hyper is one project that we're carrying out at Cranfield. Now Hyper is funded by the UK government. We've received about 8 million pounds so far and we've received another million US dollars and we've received another 100,000 pounds from Hydex. There's different funding options that we've gone for. And our project is a collaboration between Cranfield University, Ultra Ed Babcock and GTI Energy. And within this project, what we're doing is we are building a pilot plant. This is the largest pilot plant of its type in the world. In the world. It's a one megawatt pilot plant. And the idea of this is that we're demonstrating all of the key components of this process and the process, by the way, is sorbent enhanced steam methane reforming. Um, this is something that uh, Dr. Medhat was referring to earlier, and I'll come on to the chemistry of it later. But the idea is that we're demonstrating all the core components of this process so that we can de-risk the scale up in the future. 
and this pilot plant is being built at Cranfield University. Um, if you haven't been to Cranfield University, then please come along. Um, I can show you and give you a tour around the, the site. Um, but it's been built at Cranfield University just on a, a greenfield um, patch of land away from a lot of other things. And the technology behind all of this is utilizing this sorbent enhanced steam methane reforming process, which is a low cost hydrogen production method. And it doesn't just bolt on the CO2 capture onto the back end as other technologies will do, but we actually integrate the CO2 capture into the process, which ends up making the process cheaper and it makes the technology more efficient um, compared to other forms. So um, yeah, I'll continue with that. So, how does sorbent enhanced steam methane reforming work? So back in your chemistry days, when you were back at school, you probably heard of something called Le, Le Chatelier's principle. Now, if you can't remember what that is, what it does is it says, if you have a process that removes a gas from, or removes an element from one side of a reaction, it pulls the reaction over to the, the right-hand side. So in this case, we are gonna remove CO2 from the product side of these top two reactions. And we're doing that by using calcium oxide. When we remove that CO2, it pushes this water gas shift reaction over to the right-hand side to make more CO2 and more hydrogen. And that ends up saying it needs more CO. So we have to push this reaction over to the right-hand side as well. By doing all of that, it generates more hydrogen, it improves the efficiency, we get a higher yield, higher purity and higher production rates of hydrogen. Now, it's not new. None of this technology is actually new. Steam methane reforming, water gas shift is how all hydrogen is made around the world at the moment, or most of it, at least of them anyway. And the only part that's really new and new, really um, inventive is by adding this calcium looping process into the mix. So this is where we're capturing the CO2. But even here, the chemistry is not new. The inverse of this reaction is what happens inside cement works it's a very typical process at the start of a cement works, you heat up limestone and you end up making calcium oxide, which goes to make your cement. So we are not making brand new strides, but what we're really doing is we're integrating two existing processes and we're making an overall hydrogen production process that's much more efficient. This is a, a nice schematic of our power plant, of our pilot plant. And um, what we can see here is that in the center here, if I, change to laser pointer. Um, in the center here, this is the reactor. This is where all of the hydrogen is produced, all of the CO2 is captured, um, and the inputs to this are steam, natural gas, and the calcium oxide. And we then take the produced calcium carbonate and filter it from the, the hydrogen. And the output hydrogen comes out about 94% pure. The calcium carbonate loops back around to the start of the process where we put it through the big reactor at the back here, which is a calciner. This is where we heat the limestone up to a thousand degrees and drive off the CO2. And then we have a product stream of CO2 that's about 98% pure and calcium oxide, which can then be passed back around to the start of the system, thereby making a complete loop of the process. And that limestone and calcium oxide can be recycled lots and lots of times through the system. Let's keep the laser pointer on. So um, construction is well underway at Cranfield. Um, we're about 60% 60, 60 way through the completion. And really what we're waiting on at the moment is piping. Piping and electrical work is what, what's happening at the moment. Um, but here I'm showing the, the key parts of the process. So on the right hand side over here, we've got the liquid nitrogen storage system. Uh, we use liquid nitrogen to heat up to cool down, to purge the system through, to remove any oxygen. Um, and really it's a, a, a starting up system. Um, most people see this big white cylinder and get very scared thinking it's hydrogen storage and everybody's worried about the big hydrogen storage tank. But in reality, it's just liquid nitrogen that's everywhere. Um, so the other thing we've got on site is lots of shipping containers. These shipping containers contain our electrical systems, instrument air, gas compressors, gas analyzers, um, and all of that services the main reacting process. So this is where all of the hydrogen produced and all of the CO2 is captured. This is where all the reaction vessels are. And at the back, we've got a calciner. And here we have a steam generator, hydrogen vent stack, and a plane in the background because at Cranfield University, we have an airport. 
Um, we're expecting to start operating later this year. Um, I expect before summer we should be starting to produce our first hydrogen. So calcina. Um, I said earlier that calcination is a process that happens in, in cement works already. Um, so this is how they normally do it. Normally at cement works, they will have something called a rotary kiln. And you can see there's a person standing just here and you can see how big it is compared to that. These rotary kilns are two or three meters in diameter. They are 30 meters long and they are incredibly inefficient. And what we're doing is redesigning a calcination process using an indirect fired system. So this is the inside of our calciner. Um, and what happens is the limestone enters in the inside of this tube and heat is on the outside and the heat passes to the out to the through the wall of the um, of the uh, tube and into the solid material but we've um, essentially coiled up a long piece of pipe to make this cast liner and by doing so it's a much more efficient process because we can capture the all of the waste heat and we can generate steam from that waste heat as well so techno-economics, um, let's get rid of that laser pointer. So um, techno-economics, we've done a lot of analysis on this and um, it's not just us doing this analysis. We've, we have um, produced several reports, some for the UK government, some for US government, and some for the IEA GHG. But we've also had independent analysis done by the by a large multinational engineering company um, doing a complete independent analysis coming to very, very similar conclusions as us. And what we're really showing here is that the existing ways of producing hydrogen, which are these two graphs on the left hand side, the two bar graphs, um, they are the existing ways, but we are cheaper um, because we have a much lower capital cost. So the blue lines are the capital cost, and we are about half those costs. And that's because we've integrated the CO2 capture. By doing that, we don't need big water gas shift reactors. We don't need PSAs. We don't need pre reformers. Um, we've reduced the overall size of our system. Um, and the operating costs of both sides are about the same. So we've had, therefore, a lower levelized cost of hydrogen as well. So we think this process has a lot of legs to stand on and because we can achieve um, a cheaper cost of hydrogen and we can achieve very high CO2 capture rates, even with the same hydrogen purities um, and same output pressures, we think there's a lot of um, expansion that we can use for this technology. So we are actively scaling this process up. Um, we are actually in the process of working towards a 10 megawatt plant at the moment. Um, and we would hope that this process can actually scale up to the megawatt scale, the hundreds of megawatt scale in the future. Um, something we're doing with Hyper at the moment, or what we have done with Hyper, is we've actually been changing the feedstock. So we've looked at um, not a natural gas feedstock, where we said, well, what happens if you used a biomass feedstock? And we did a separate project called BioHyper on that. And we've also been looking at um, where could we use this hydrogen in the UK? If we were going to go to the next commercial scale plant, where would we build it? Would we go to a gas turbine site and dilute some of the incoming natural gas with hydrogen, um, thereby offsetting some of their CO2 emissions? Um, so we've been looking at that. And we have also been starting work on a seven megawatt plant, seven to 10 megawatt plant, um, which uh, GTI Energy have just received some investment for. Um, and we are always open to new research projects. There's loads more work that can be done around solvent enhanced reforming and steam methane reforming. And there are lots more um, scale up opportunities that we're actively engaging with. Um, because of that, HIDEX have secured some funding and um, enabled Hyper to engage with industry and engage with others. So this will allow other industries or other interested parties to access the facilities at Hyper and other hydrogen production facilities across the, the UK. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, uh, please see the website or get in contact with me. Uh, this is a, an overview of the BioHyper project. As I mentioned, we changed the feedstock to look at a biogas feedstock by thereby generating a carbon negative hydrogen, um, which would be very useful for many countries around the world to offset emissions whilst it's still achieving hydrogen production at a, at a reasonable cost. Uh, very recently, we won a hydrogen award. This is the first hydrogen gas awards in the UK. Actually, no, it wasn't just the UK, it was international. Uh, we, re we received the Academic Excellence in Hydrogen Research and Innovation Award. Um, so we're very pleased to win that. 
and hopefully there'll be many more soon. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Sir Peter, for your uh, insightful uh, talk. Very interesting presentation. And uh, yeah, so we have here, I uh, will be just our, our panel as well uh, of a speaker. If you have any question, please yeah, go ahead as well. Uh, then I can just read to Dr. Peter if he uh, the, the question from here. So, Dr. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, good morning, maybe. So, uh, nice to have you here. If you have any question, we have uh, Kurzaki as well. If you have a question, uh, Dr. Miming, however, is uh, your your next office, maybe Dr. Peter. Yeah. <laughs> For sure, please go ahead. Any of you? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we have here uh, two questions for uh, Dr. Peter. I think one of them has been already answered in uh, the slide. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Abu Zarkhan, he's asking what is the purity of hydrogen obtained by absorption enhanced steam methane reforming? Uh, I think Dr. Peter, you mentioned about this. Yes, it's about 94% pure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, Dr. Rehsan Ali as well is asking a question about blue hydrogen from methane reforming. It has one serious uh, concern is that we have unburned CH4 emission, which is a kind of 4 to 5% in the environment, which may cause maybe more harmful than uh, emitting carbon dioxide itself. So how do you see this concern? Please? So the unburnt CH4 emissions uh, wouldn't actually exist. Any unburnt CH4 would be sent back into the system to be utilized to convert into hydrogen or would be combusted into CO2. So um, we of course want to minimize that as much as possible, definitely want to minimize it. Um, but some methane slip through the reactor is, is expected. Um, it wouldn't be a 100% 100, 100 efficient process. Um, therefore we are either recycling high methane background or we are utilizing the methane to provide heat. Yeah, uh, we have another question from uh, Dr. Mahmoud Abdel Nabi asking about uh, using fixed bed reactor in absorption and density steam system reforming. It's definitely possible. Um, it's definitely possible. We've seen lots and lots of research papers utilizing fixed bed reactors. Um, we think there are some clear advantages to fluidized bed reactors. They are more complicated to operate, but uh, you get much better heat transfer, mass transfer, pressure drops. Um, so in, the, in that respect, it's much easier to, to scale the system up to, um, to, to be bigger, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my as well, and maybe this is a late question from my side because I already was at Cranfield and I went to this location. <laughs> <of> this. <laughs> yeah, one megawatt uh, plant. Uh, but here you are using uh, two materials, one for uh, reforming as a catalyst and uh, one other one for as uh, absorption. Yeah. So I think maybe the next step is to maybe um, to something like bifunctional material, only one material for post. Yes, definitely. I think um, I think that's got a lot a lot of legs to stand on. Um, I think um, it's going to be complicated because, um, as uh, Dr. Zaki was showing earlier, uh, making new materials and um, scaling those materials up to be larger systems is, is challenging. Um, but yes, I think it's it's got a lot of legs to stand on um, by functional materials. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Peter, for being with us uh, today. Uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. And thanks Thank for that full talk. Inshallah, we'll be in contact for sure. So uh, our uh, next speaker, we have also uh, our dear friend and dear colleagues, uh, Dr. Miming Zhou from uh, University of uh, Cranfield. He is a senior lecturer in chemical engineering at Cranfield uh, University. And as well, he is a junket uh, research fellow at the University of Western Australia. Uh, from where he got his uh, PhD and he got uh, his master's degree from <clears throat> uh, his bachelor degree in thermal engineering from University of Science and Technology, Beijing, 2006. Uh, master's degree <clears throat> in, in bar engineering and engineering uh, thermophysics from uh, Tsinghua University in uh, 2008, and uh, his PhD from in chemical engineering and the processing. In, in chemical and processing engineering uh, in uh, the University of Western Australia. And this was in 2013, uh, followed by uh, his was working as a research fellow uh, and research uh, program coordinator at the University of Western Australia. Uh, he has expertise, uh, Dr. Meming, in uh, chemical reaction engineering science like uh, combustion, uh, thermodynamics, 
uh, with a specific application uh, as a matter of, also in thermal in, in, in thermal science as well like combustion thermodynamic and uh, also in energy uh, technologies he is also have some work in solid gas reaction and the catalytic reaction uh, he is working also in the downstream part for uh, ammonia uh, as a low carbon fuel uh, and different other uh, fuels applied catalyst for environmental emission control and waste uh, polarization and so on. So uh, welcome uh, to be as a matter of fact, we are, have the honor to have Dr. Meming with us uh, tonight. He will give us a talk on uh, uh, on uh, hydrogen on ammonia as uh, as a carbon free fuel and also as a hydrogen carrier so the floor is your Dr. Miming, please yeah, you have a kind of uh, 20 to 25 minutes followed by five minutes for for question and answer so, so please go ahead and share your screen thank you <clears throat> thank you Mihat, for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting to the workshop and uh, let me share my screen Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Please go perfect. ahead. Good. Yeah, thank, uh, thanks again for the for the introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Min Drew. I'm a senior lecturer in chemical engineering at the Cranfield and uh, working with Peter in you know, ammonia hydrogen area. Uh, yeah, uh, my topic today is uh, mainly focus on using ammonia as a hydrogen carrier, and also we can use ammonia as the, as carbon fuel directly. So, uh, you know, the topic of today is about hydrogen. You know, hydrogen is not new actually. You know, it, it, in 1970s, 1990s, so we have hydrogen. This time, I believe it is uh, you know driven by different uh, purpose like you know environmental you know uh, uh, issues we can produce hydrogen and we can use hydrogen but actually we all know that hydrogen is very hard to store and transport this is a challenge and of course we, you know particularly you know if we're talking about the high pressure compression or using liquefied hydrogen and it is very the cost is very high and that's why you know ammonia and other hydrogen carrier and comes in and there are different types of uh, hydrogen carriers you know, metal you know hide and uh, other chemicals of course uh, why we focus on ammonia so first of all uh, in terms of a hydrogen mass content ammonia is probably one of the highest almost you know 18 percent by mass and then ammonia can be easily liquefied and uh, you know you know, around nine bar and at room temperature is already liquid like LPG. Uh, ammonia production method is already there commercially and uh, we have established infrastructure and the distribution network basically is very easy to transport and for commercially you don't need to make any significant changes to, to, the, to the existing uh, transportation industry. And of course, as uh, you know, uh, Professor Zaki has mentioned, actually ammonia can be produced from renewable solar hydrogen directly. So if we look at the whole uh, ammonia value chain here, uh, actually, you know, ammonia at the moment is produced uh, uh, from, you know, coal, natural gas, and whatever, the process, the, the feedstock which contains hydrogen, goes through like, you know, gasification, pyrolysis, even water electrolysis nowadays for hydrogen production. And nitrogen is separated from air, and it combines hydrogen and nitrogen to produce ammonia. At the moment, ammonia is uh, widely used uh, as agriculture fertilizer, and of course, as a refrigeration uh, system, it, and mine applications as in, in the material uh, uh, areas. And now we try to extend the use of ammonia to uh, transportation, storage, and fuel, heat, and power generation. So basically, we try to extend the use of ammonia to another new areas. So in terms of the, pro that's why I say in terms of the production, the use, no big issues with ammonia, even the safety concerns, there are regulations, you know, we know how to handle it uh, in terms of the engineering. So now the difficulty maybe is how to produce ammonia from the renewable resources at a low cost and how to effectively use ammonia as a fuel. So just to give you an overview of the you know, ammonia going 
globally how much ammonia is produced and actually and most of ammonia is produced in, in China, Russia, because naturally is in uh, you know, a lot of coal, uh, very cheap, you know, natural gas and coal based feedstock, and they are using lots of fertilizers. And at, at the moment, as I see in the Saudi Arab, they're still one of the top ammonia producer, uh, which is good if you can ease if you convert to ammonia as a hydrogen carrier. I believe you already have the ammonia production plant and uh, uh, handling of ammonia and use ammonia as a, you know a fertilizer. So if you look at the storage and distribution network, this is the work map, and you can see. And all the red dot points here is the port around the world. And you have the green, you know, small dots here is uh, is actually the, the use and use and the, the industry clusters for ammonia use. So no, you know, as you can see in the world, you can transfer ammonia inland trucks, tanks, or you can transfer ammonia from why you know from, from Europe to the UK, even from the US to the UK by shipping. I believe they are also have the shipping, you know, uh, uh, infrastructures from the uh, Saudi Arab to the Europe and UK as well. So I just have the Europe, you know, the the on the uh, right side of the the map is actually is the ammonia transportation pipelines in the Europe, in the North Europe, which is actually shipping ammonia to the UK because the UK does not produce that a lot of ammonia. It does, but not that much. So we import lots of ammonia from North Europe, which has a uh, uh, you know, uh, um, a lot of uh, natural gas. Actually, in terms of the storage, storage and distribution, ammonia here, uh, uh, the IEA has done some you know, uh, very pre preliminary technical economic analysis to say, uh, you know, to compare different uh, hydrogen storage media. And uh, actually they found ammonia is uh, one of the most economically you know, viable uh, method to transport hydrogen, particularly for very long distance transportation. For example, if you produce it in Saudi Arabia and transfer to UK, the so ammonia is definitely one of the best options to transport hydrogen. So as I mentioned, ammonia production conventionally from natural gas, most most you know use natural gas as a feedstock, not man but in China, India, they, they have coal, they use coal gasification for hydrogen. But in the rest of the world, they use natural gas for hydrogen production and hydrogen with nitrogen goes through the conventional Haber-Bosch process, which operate at, at around 400 degrees C at you know, two to 300 bar. So the cost actually, the cost of ammonia is mainly from the cost of natural gas. That's why in the last few years, particularly when there's a war between Ukraine and Russia, the natural gas you know, price goes up and the ammonia production goes up. So, so it depends you know, how cheap you know, the, a natural gas, the feedstock it is. At the moment, of course, we're talking about CCS, try to capture the CO2. And of course, we can capture CO2 during the natural gas reforming process, as Peter just mentioned before. And uh, the only challenge is try will will increase the cost of ammonia production a little bit simply by the additional cost to hydrogen. If by you know in Peter's technology, if we can reduce the cost of hydrogen, so it's no it's very good for ammonia production as well. So what I talked before is actually you use natural gas with the filter capture, which is you know called blue, brown, whatever. And now everybody is talking about the green ammonia production, which is directly from either the hydrogen from electrolysis combined with nitrogen to produce ammonia, or we can directly through the new process, new technologies here, like Dr. Saki just mentioned before, and you have electrolysis process. And of course, people talking the biological nitrogen fixture, and also you have the uh, plasma process. But of course, this new emerging technology is uh, is is uh, very, at very low TRL level. is in the research stage, and we can't we haven't seen any commercial or demonstration plant yet. But for the electrolysis for hydrogen production, and definitely here we have uh, uh, 
commercial, you know, electrolysis process, if we produce hydrogen, go through our Bosch process, can produce ammonia. The main cost is is actually the electricity. Basically, it's a hydrogen production cost here. Okay. In the worldwide, basically, ammonia as a hydrogen carrier or, or as a fuel is driven by Japan. Actually, in, the, in Japan, they, they 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 are very actively using ammonia because they import hydrogen overseas. Uh, in Australia, they produce a uh, uh, lot of uh, you know hydrogen in the re using renewable energy because they have uh, a large land, abundant solar panels. So they produce hydrogen and they sell hydrogen in the form of ammonia to Japan using existing uh, infrastructure because they are currently selling a lot of LPG or LNG to Japan. And in in US, they also try to develop combined ammonia productions and uh, with the fertilizer systems in the agriculture, and they try to integrate electrolysis, ammonia productions, fertilizer, and and of course expand the use of ammonia as a fuel. Uh, in, in in the UK, actually, you know, uh, Simmons uh, working with uh, Cardiff University, uh, and they also try to demonstrate ammonia in the gas turbines as well. So in the worldwide, ammonia uh, is as a fuel has attracted a lot of attention uh, at the moment. Of course, when we're talking about using ammonia as as a fuel, so one thing we can't ignore is actually the importance of energy density here. So if we look at uh, compare the hydrogen with uh, you know ammonia, hydrogen even at you know compressed uh, at one hundred. 50 bar, even at 700 bar nowadays, and the energy density from the volumetric energy density is still less than ammonia. So ammonia energy density is very close to like methanol DME, uh, ethanol. So not too bad. It's about half of the you know diesel, petrol, and uh, kerosene. So so in terms of the energy density here, so it looks like. Ammonia is is competitive as well. It's possible, feasible as well. When people are talking about energy density, what I presented before is simply we're looking at the volumetric or the uh, mass uh, best uh, uh, you know energy density. Here, I want to point it out. Here, if we want to use ammonia as a fuel, we we'll draw it into whether it's internal combustion engines or furnace. The energy inside of the chamber is not the energy of the fuel itself. It also have the air inside of the chamber. So we are talking about the energy density under the air fuel mixture. So if we look at look at the stoichiometric uh, conditions of ammonia and gasoline as a com comparison, so because ammonia requires less air to burn, so if in the Certain size of the engines. If for the same amount of the fuel, basically ammonia would require less air. So the total energy density is not that bad. So if you define the heating value of the stoichiometric mixtures, so ammonia is competitive to gasoline if we are looking at the internal combustion engine. So, so it is very promising. And we all know that. Ammonia can be used as a fuel. It's not new. Actually, in the Second World War, uh, in Germany, they already tried to use ammonia as a fuel. But the challenge here, relating to the use of ammonia as a fuel, is to burn it effectively. Uh, ammonia has a very slow flame speed. It's only seven centimeters per second. It's about one fifth of methane of that of methane. Uh, what we are doing at the moment proposed is actually it can be partially dissociated ammonia before it is injected into the engines or even injected into the gas turbines or furnace. So ammonia can be partially dissociated into uh, hydrogen ammonia nitrogen mixtures. The, the purpose to have a small amount of hydrogen here is try to increase the ignition and to enhance the burning of ammonia. So that's why we have done um, a lot of uh, you know, fundamental studies uh, in the lab. For example, if we look at the flame speed, the laminar flame speed, we use Bunsen burner and uh, you know, the, 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 the vertical tube. As you can see here, if we you know, have like 5% or 10% you know, dissociation of ammonia, 
and you can increase the burning velocity of ammonia hydrogen mixtures by at least you know you can double the flame speed basically and of course another challenge with ammonia if you use in the internal combustion engines is hard to ignite it because ammonia has a, a high very high minimum ignition energy that's why if you have a, a small amount of hydrogen here and we use the, like Hammond bomb and you can see no matter at what equivalence ratio at what the, the gap between the sparks and you can reduce the minimum ignition energy significantly if you have a, a small amount of hydrogen in the system so so that already proved that if we can a uh, partial dissociate an ammonia to have like uh, even five ten percent of hydrogen in the system and you can reduce the minimum ignition energy significantly and you can double at least the flame speed of ammonia which is not too bad and people also try to demonstrate ammonia hydrogen you know mixtures in internal combustion engines as you can see the power output from the internal combustion engines with the use of ammonia is much lower than the gasoline which is not surprising because of the heating total heating value however but if at a low you know engine speed and with the slow burning so that can make sure that ammonia uh, have enough time to burn. So the overall power output of ammonia hydrogen mixtures can be competitive to gasoline, even with a very small amount of hydrogen here. So not too bad, actually. And if you look at the thermal efficiency, and uh, you can see, of course, the, the overall power of ammonia hydrogen mixtures is lower than gasoline, but the overall thermal efficiency is not uh, lower than gasoline at all don't forget because ammonia has a, a very high minimum ignition energy and a very slow burning and that's why you can operate ammonia and hydrogen as a high compression ratio for the engine by increasing the uh, compression ratio and you can increase the thermal efficiency so if you can operate ammonia and hydrogen at a higher uh, compression ratio compared with the gasoline it can so basically, you can even get higher thermal efficiency. So the, now, the, 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 the very important question re regarding the use of direct burning ammonia is actually the NOx emissions. Everybody gets concerned of, you know, ammonia has a, a few hard nitrogen in the fuel, and when it burns, it will produce a, a lot of NOx. Actually, you know, when people try to burn ammonia uh, hydrogen <laughs> mixtures in the engine, Actually, it's not that bad. We can't see any significant increase of NOx. Of course, it has high NOx at a certain equivalence ratios at a high level. But if you run it at a slightly fuel rich, you can even reduce NOx significantly because of the in C2 selective, selective NOx reduction. So if we look at the NOx formation and destruction mechanism, and in ammonia combustion process, actually, the the NH radicals play an important role. It can lead to NOx reduction formation, but also simultaneously, it can also lead to the simultaneous NOx reduction at, in the engine itself. So that's why when we talk about the NOx emission from ammonia combustion is not you know, surprisingly high. Of course, it, it will be high, you know, as, as you can see, it's not like five ppm or 10 ppm. But with the existing, the after treatment exhaust, you know, after treatment uh, system, so we should be able to to handle uh, NOx emission from ammonia combustion. At Cranfield, uh, uh, we also have uh, because Cranfield is uh, very good in the gas turbine development for the uh, aero you know, space, and uh, th we have uh, you know, high pressure, high temperature, you know, a dedicated uh, systems for. Uh, hydrogen and ammonia combustion and we, we are going to we don't have any data yet we haven't run the system with ammonia yet but hopefully and later if we run it and we can see how it performs to simulate the, the gas turbine you know combustion process at Cranfield, we are not only working on ammonia combustion directly they use it as a fuel we also try to correct ammonia back to hydrogen we use the electrochemical way and uh, to you know uh, convert the ammonia back to hydrogen 
to point it out here, so ammonia as a hydrogen carrier, we can use it as a fuel and convert it into back to hydrogen is actually, to be honest, is an energy intensive process. At the moment, we also have a, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of research groups in the world try to crack ammonia back to hydrogen, including ours, electrochemical. And uh, like you, you use a thermal ruthenium, uh, you know, nickel catalyst to crack it back. So the, it is a, a, a high temperature process. And also when you crack ammonia back to hydrogen, the, the challenge is still have uncracked ammonia, it's the residue ammonia in the system, and you have to purify the ammonia hydrogen system to meet the fuel cell application. That purification to remove ammonia from the ammonia hydrogen mixtures after the cracking is a very challenging process. That's why this is a chemical, uh, electrochemical process, we try to get rid of that you know, step. And uh, we are setting up this system uh, in the lab, and uh, so hopefully we can get some you know, uh, promising data in the future. And of course, we also have uh, you know, the kilowatt scale solid oxide fuel cell, we can directly use ammonia. And in this case, basically for ammonia solid oxide fuel cell applications, is ammonia on uh, the electrodes will go through ammonia cracking, in situ cracking to produce hydrogen and hydrogen through solid oxide fuel cell for electricity you know, production. So that's what we are working on as well. Uh, another uh, point I would like to, 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 to mention is that we also have a group working on the direct ammonia recovery from uh, waste water. Uh, we, we know ammonia is actually is an emission from a waste water treatment plant, and usually people will get rid of ammonia by burning it. And uh, here, and we try to recover it and concentrate it and use it as a fuel. And we have lab scale uh, batch reactors and continuous reactor systems and try to concentrate ammonia at the moment uh, by using a, a vacuum a, a thermal stripping process. And with that concentration of ammonia, we can directly use it in the solid oxide fuel cell. So in a nutshell, so for the future, you know, a perspective, we believe ammonia can be an excellent hydrogen carrier, particularly for the very long distance transportation. Uh, for example, in the UK market, we probably don't have enough renewable electricity to produce enough hydrogen to meet, uh, you know, 2050 to meet net zero, and we need to import hydrogen. So ammonia maybe is one of the options to consider. And we can use directed ammonia as a fuel, but of course, as I mentioned, technical innovations are required, and particularly for, you know, some you know, fundamental scientific knowledge are needed to understand you know, the combustion characteristics, not formation mechanisms. And if we want to convert it back using electrochemical way and uh, you know, in the fuel cell, so you need to understand the electrochemical you know, performance as well. As I mentioned, you know, to use ammonia as a hydrogen carrier, we need, to, um, we, all, we need to look at the whole value chain to make sure the whole system is carbon free. And we have to understanding you know or develop the new technologies for ammonia synthesis using green energy and of course if you want to use the hydrogen directly you have to convert ammonia back to hydrogen and also another potential application for ammonia is try to link the water and energy sectors together not only the energy we are talking about okay thank you that's uh, my presentation and uh, any questions Yes, thanks, Dr. Ravening, for uh, the very interesting presentation related to hydrogen ammonia. As you said, we have Saudi Arabia here is uh, one of the top uh, producers, as a matter of fact, for ammonia. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, if we have uh, any of our uh, panel member, if you have any question before we can go ahead and uh, read the other question. Yeah, yeah I, I actually have a quick question. Uh... Uh, so how do you deal with the toxicity of ammonia? Like if it was going to be used as a fuel, if you will, um, how do you handle that? Can, you, you mean ammonia handle in... It, no, I mean, ammonia ha has some toxicity, right? It's uh... like a toxic, right? It's a toxic gas. Um, you know, so if it essentially... <clears throat> If, if we are talking implementing in burning it in internal combustion engines or gas turbines, um, 
in general, fuels, uh, you know, we are worried because they can leak and burn. Now, ammonia, it can leak and it can kill you. So what is your thoughts about that? So to be honest, that, that is actually something people considering uh, developing. Ammonia in, if you, you, it has toxicity, actually the toxicity is not that as uh, bad as we thought if we do have, uh, you know, the control system. In the existing industry handling ammonia, we already have the regulations, the procedures to handle ammonia. And uh, for the few applications, uh, definitely there will be challenge for the mobile, small scale application for the car, for example. But for the stationary application, for the stationary and the relatively large scale, so you, you handle the ammonia as the storage safety shouldn't be a challenge, I believe. So for the materials, I believe uh, for ammonia in the internal combustion engines, if we use like stainless steel tubes, it's already safe enough to handle ammonia. So, so I, I can't say that's the easy way to solve it as I feel that's potential challenge here. So, but I think if we take the experience from other industries for the stationary large scale applications, it may be, you know, is applicable. Mm. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Dr. Bassam. So I think here uh, every direction will put uh, its limitations. So it, it depends. For sure. Application mm -hmm. even for hydrogen itself, when you try to use hydrogen for internal combustion engine or gas turbines. So I think it, it will be limited for a given application because we have high competition coming from hydrogen fuel cell and others. So I think the case will be I any mean, maybe specific for a given application. We may see something that is better than as other and the other may be better in another application. So, yeah. however, gas turbine is something valuable, and uh, yeah, I, I I understand the question by Dr. Bassam is uh, uh, aero engineer at GE, so uh, he usually cares about gas turbines. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we have here another question from uh, Dr. Hassan Ali. We have uh, he talks about ammonia decomposition occurring in uh, gaseous or liquid form. Uh, this is his question. Also, is ammonia corrosion and it's a bioharm is uh, a limitation for its uh, decomposition or uh, direct burning as a fuel? How we deal as well with NOx emissions? So it's uh, a kind of three questions. <laughs> uh, no, no, that, that, that's, uh, that's reasonable. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, handled, uh, ammonia corrosion is, is not that, uh, it's not the big problem. In, even in the engines, uh, people try to use the stainless steel in the pipe to replace the current pipe is working. And uh, I'm not the material people, but I know it is a, a problem uh, in the research area at the moment. It even including people try to study uh, ammonia during combustion process in the combustion chamber, the ammonia radicals, the interaction with the materials in the engine, in, inside the materials. I believe there's an area for us to look into it. But before it comes to the engine storage, the pipeline, that corrosion should be a big problem because they already have the solution to handle it in terms of the material because the temperature is not high. And uh, in terms of the NOx, as I mentioned, uh, it actually the yeah. NOx emission is not as high as we usually thought and is comparative uh, to gasoline without any treatment uh, after treatment uh, uh, systems. So if we do have the after treatment, for example, actually in the engine station or engine system, if we can draw a little bit of ammonia from the fuel tank and take it back to, as a reductant to reduce ammonia, so basically this is like a, you know selective catalytic reduction for NOx reduction in the coal power plants and in the, in the diesel engines. So it's a commercial. I don't think any challenge technically challenge to do that. Maybe the only concern is the cost. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Miming. I think, yeah, because uh, we have ammonia is low burning, you have low burning speed, and it will result in cold combustion temperature. So the thermal NOx in this case will be... Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and this is the thermal NOx is, yeah, is the most important one. But this is a kind of fuel NOx that we expect yeah. already. And mm -hmm. maybe with some treatment or fuel blending, I think this may not be the, the main issue here for ammonia. Uh, so, yeah, we have also... Uh, another question from uh, Dr. Abu Zarkhan, he asked about uh, during catalytic combustion uh, with 100% combustion uh, occurs, he asked about maybe about combustion uh, 
efficiency. If not, then what about uh, the unburned ammonia during uh, the catalytic combustion? I don't think there will be any, um, but that's, that's a good point actually, uh, you know, for ammonia combustion, whether it's catalytic or not catalytic combustion, so there will be some ammonia, you know, unburned ammonia is called the residue and ammonia sleep. So at the moment, what we plan to is uh, try to control the equivalence ratio uh, further from the from one to reduce the uh, best reduce the residue ammonia from the combustion process. The second is if there are even in the PPM level, if there's a potential toxic environmental issues, and there's actually commercial ammonia sleep catalyst, so that will be placed before the exhaust after treatment plant before that uh, that system. So you can handle ammonia sleep as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one, thank you, Dr. Manning. So one last question from uh, Dr. Mahmoud of the Navi. He is asking about uh, and comparing the prices uh, between the ammonia produced from uh, uh, NA2 fixation and the ammonia produced from uh, through green hydrogen, and then we can have uh, produce ammonia? Is there a kind of comparison in terms of cost? Actually, at the moment, ammonia production from natural gas, usually it depends on the net price of the natural gas is about $300 tons in normal price. I believe last year, you know, it will at least double because simply because of natural gas, $300 per ton. For direct electrolysis, for the, when I say direct, is electrolysis to hydrogen and hydrogen to ammonia. So you will at least you will increase the cost by like twenty or twenty five percent because of the electrolysis cost. Of course, it depends where you are, you produce electricity and where do you you know if we I believe in Australia or in Saudi Arabia you have lots of solar energy it's much cheap. If we in the UK it will be very expensive. And if people talking about direct electrolysis to ammonia synthesis. At the moment, there's no commercial, and the cost will be extremely high because the, simply because of the efficiency is very very low at the moment. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Doctor, okay. for being with us uh, this uh, night. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, yeah, for sure we'll be in, in contact over uh, inshallah in near future. So our uh, last speaker. Uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Bassam Abdel Nabi is uh, will give us uh, a talk about uh, uh, in the downstream. Still, we are talking about uh, the downstream on hydrogen combustion challenges and the uh, future outlook. Uh, we have Dr. Bassam Abdel Nabi is a seasoned aero engineer with over a kind of twenty years of experience in the field of thermal science. Uh, he got uh, his uh, master uh, degree from uh, mechanical bar engineering from Cairo University in Egypt, his master degree in uh, nuclear engineering from Missouri Science and Technology, uh, and his PhD in uh, gas turbine combustion uh, from the University of uh, uh, Cincinnati in uh, 2010, Ohio. Uh, he has here, he's a senior engineer at GE Aerospace. Uh, he leads the emission diagnostics and the improvement for uh, the engine uh, LMS 100. Uh, he has also, uh, uh, mashallah, a great number of publications published uh, externally and internally within uh, GE, uh, maybe due to classification of data. We have Dr. Abin Nabi, he spent a kind of 12 years of uh, at GE research. Uh, he was also uh, an instrumental in uh, the development and the patenting of uh, Brylo emission 3 and 2.4 combustion technologies. Uh, his expertise in uh, diagnostics and uh, modification of combustion system to operate on a wide range of fuels, including hydrogen, uh, crude oil, as well as natural gas, uh, jet A, diesel, and distillate. Uh, so many fuels. However, I know gas turbine is highly sensitive to the fuel. This is something that we need. Uh, to keep it performing well. So Dr. Bassam, the floor is yours, uh, at last but not least for sure. Uh, you have a kind of uh, yeah, 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, this will be followed by question and answer. The floor is yours, uh, please go ahead. Sure. Yeah, thank you so much. Let me start by making sure you can see my screen. Yes, perfect, yeah. All right, and... Okay, 
so, you know, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this talk. It's exciting um, uh, to get together and discuss more about, uh, you know, hydrogen. Um, um, so, uh, just, just a little bit note before we start, all the data I'm going to be showing and the information is essentially just uh, uh, it's GE property information and using it, uh, essentially, if you intend to use it, you have to get permission uh, from GE Aerospace. So you just heard a little bit summary about me. I'm not going to go over this again, um, but, uh, you know, let's say my focus has been gas turbine combustion uh, for about 15 years uh, so far. Um, I've been working with GE since I graduated. In fact, I've been working with GE since I did my PhD in aerospace engineering uh, because the lab I was working in at the time was essentially funded by GE Aerospace. And, you know, funny enough, I was working on the LMS 100 at the time and years passed and I'm working on the LMS 100 again now, which is kind of, you know, you never know what is destined for you. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, um, you know, global energy outlook and try, try to kind of put hydrogen in perspective. And this is gonna be in my eyes, meaning that it's not GE's opinion, right? And it can, it may be right, maybe wrong, but it will be my opinion. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the motivation of the data I will show you today. Um, and then I will show you some of the modeling results we did to kind of understand burning hydrogen in uh, combustion systems, if you will. I'll show you some um, uh, estimates on the, um, you know, impact on NOx emissions, flame speed, blow off time. Um, and then I will show you some experimental results we did on some of our combustion technologies, if you will. Um, and then just a little note about, you know, how NOx is today uh, monitored and, you know, environmental agencies set certain limits uh, primarily based on what we call NOx-15 or NOx corrected to 15% oxygen. There's a little bit uh, uh, information that I think uh, researchers and people working in the field need to uh, have the back of their heads. And I have a little bit, uh, you know, a bonus at the end, the research ideas. I think we have lots of people today who work in the field of combustion and the field of research. So I thought it may be interesting to very quickly show you some ideas you can be working on that to the best of my knowledge, nobody has done yet. And the industrial community and the combustion community kind of needs this data, if you will. So this is the summary of what we're gonna be covering in the next 20 minutes or so, if you will. All right. Um, so today, right, if you look at the energy economy today, we may be able to say roughly that um, you know, crude oil, coal, and natural gas, they represent around 84% of the energy economy. That leaves 16% for everything else. So you hear about hydro, geothermal, solar, wind, and everything else, including hydrogen. If you sum them all up, that's around 16%. Now, the amount of money is huge. So essentially you are talking uh, maybe $4 trillion or so, right? And um, we, we need to, to have a feel. I don't know why the, the PowerPoint kind of keeps flipping on its own. I, I don't have it set this way, but maybe there's an option that makes it uh, flip. So, so anyways, so if you, if you essentially look at the uh, cost of one gigajoule of oil today is roughly $5, right? CO2 is bad, as we heard today. We understand that, but crude oil is free. It's under the ground. You dig, you bring it up. Coal is the same thing. You mine, you bring it up. Natural gas is the same thing, right? But hydrogen, you don't. Hydrogen, one thing that is kind of not being talked too much about in the industry is hydrogen, you have, to, you have to make it. You have to make the, you have to pay to make it, and then you use it. It doesn't exist. Um, so think about it this way. Imagine tomorrow we run out of crude oil and you know, 
it disappears. We don't have any crude oil and we switch to hydrogen. Just think of it as today you board the plan, you pay $1,500, right? And imagine that goes up to $6,000 just because we've switched to using hydrogen or your utility bill that you pay at, pay at your home. Let's say you pay 150 bucks and that goes up to $600. You know, hydrogen is very expensive. So the reason I'm giving you some numbers to give you a feel is today end consumers, they pay for everything. Me and you, we pay for everything. So I don't think end consumers will accept that anybody tells them you have to, starting tomorrow, pay more money to ride an airplane because of the cost of the fuel. We have to get you to pay to make the fuel, right? So in my opinion that, and this is again, it's my opinion. I have it very clear here. This is my opinion, not GE's opinion. That the hydrogen economy is not going to exceed 2% of the global energy market until crude oil and natural gas and coal are depleted. When they are gone, the story will be different. But until then, it's not going to exceed 2% of the global energy market, in my opinion. So let's say the future comes, right? When we are, we travel to the future and there's no conventional oils. How would the future look like? This slide, you can spend enough time. I'm not going to spend enough time to walk you over the thought process behind this slide, but you can spend the time later on. I'm just going to give you roughly what it says. You know, in the future, there will be things that will generate energy. And this is going to be probably nuclear, hydro, wind, solar, geothermal, tidal, wave energy. In my opinion, these are going to be the percentages we will see in future, right? Nuclear is going to pick up, hydro is going to double, wind is going to quadruple, uh, you know, solar is going to be maybe, you know, 15 times or so. Things are going to pick up, but this will be your energy sources. And those energy sources essentially will be feeding up your economy at the time. Um, so essentially, you will have to have some storage for this energy as it's being used. Some of it will be used directly in you know, things that are not transportation based. So industrial, residential, commercial. Uh, but other than that, for transportation mainly, you need storage, batteries will be used, biofuels will be used, hydrogen will be used. And essentially, in my opinion, um, when the time comes, batteries will be the primary source for energy for road transportation, cars, trucks, they will be using batteries, in my opinion, in the future, right? That's roughly 83% of that sector today, if you will. I'm not ex expecting it to change. Um, jet engines, in my opinion, will use hydrogen. And that's around 9% of our energy today. The maritime, like the ships, right? In my opinion, they will use hydrogen. Railroads, in my opinion, they will use biofuels, right? And if you look essentially at the commercial, residential and industrial sector today, they use peaking gas turbines. They are very important part of our grid. I expect that to continue. And I expect that to continue to be using gas turbines as it is today. And this roughly 7% of that sector is essentially powered by peaking gas units today. So I have a little number here that I think is very important. It's the fundamental of this estimate, which is how much do you pay to get a unit energy? So for example, today, if you do a bioethanol, you pay 1.2 energy units. You have to pay this energy units to get one energy unit back. For a biodiesel is much better today. It's actually very good. You pay about one third of a unit and you get back a unit. Hydrogen is kind of the worst. You pay 1.6 units and you get back a unit. Batteries, to make a battery, you spend one energy unit and it lives for 20 energy cycle units. Right? 
meaning that every 20 units of energy, you'll have to pay one more time to make a new battery because your battery is not gonna be usable, right? So if you do some rough estimate, you'll end up with this statement down here. In my opinion, not GE's opinion, that in the future, the hydrogen economy will grow and will be a five to 10% of the global energy economy. This is roughly the size it will be. And to the most part, it will be gas turbines and internal combustion engines. So having said that, having said that hydrogen is going to be potentially a part of our future, it's going to be burned in gas turbines. So we wanna discuss a little bit, uh, why is it challenging? to burn it, right? Um, the content of hydrogen, you know, maybe your fuel has 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%. How does that influence the process? Um, we're gonna compare it to propane for some technical reasons. Uh, I can tell you when time comes, but it's very good to compare it to something that you know. Anything you're probably trying to understand, you compare it to something that you know, right? Um, then we talk a little bit We've seen, we touched a little bit today on the NOx emissions that will be generated when you switch to burning hydrogen. Um, so essentially we're gonna discuss a little bit about, um, you know, we'll give a sample case. When we switch from natural gas to hydrogen, what happened to the NOx emissions? We'll discuss a little bit about modeling tools, if they can capture NOx emissions today or not, the existing modeling tools we have and essentially how will the combustion systems of the future look like uh, when we start burning hydrogen. This is roughly, we don't need to go over all this, but this is at least what's in my mind. Okay. So let's start by flame speed. So we have seen some nice videos today uh, that uh, Dr. Meng Meng was showing you for laminar flame speed. And if the audience noticed, you can run faster than the laminar flame speed. It's a good game you can maybe play with the kids. You know, take some gasoline, make a line on the ground, light it up and let your kids run. Oh, they will run much faster than it. That's laminar flame speed. Now this laminar flame speed, if you switch to hydrogen, it grows roughly 50 times. So it's 50 times faster. It's about nine meters a second. You may not be able to run from that. Now, the problem with that is the flame speed is a very important design parameter for gas turbines. Um, and essentially, you may say, but laminar flame speed is laminar. You know, we don't have that in, in gas turbines. It's more of turbulent. That's correct. But to the most part, people correlate turbulent to laminar flame speed. So an understanding of the impact on laminar flame speed is very important for you to actually be able to model the turbulent flame speed with hydrogen burning. So as a starting point, it is a huge concern because the flame is extremely fast. It's a very fast flame, very dangerous flame, if you wanna put it this way. Now, one other way to essentially understand it um, is also look at what we call the blow off time. So what, what is a blow off time? One way to think about it is it's the ability of the mixer to extinct the flame if it sits where it's not supposed to sit, right? So when we design a gas turbine, you have a mixer, it's mixing air and fuel, and then you have the flame. We don't want the flame to sit in the mixer. The parameter that you use for that is called blow off time. Uh, different manufacturers use different things. For example, some of our competitors, they control it with a different way. We go very safe in our designs and we make the mixer inherently safe that it cannot hold a flame. This is called blow off time. This is how GE does it, if you will. So if you plot the blow off time and on the X axis, you put the percentage of hydrogen or propane the reason I'm comparing to propane is because we understand propane today. We have machines in the field running at high propane percent. We have SAC machines running on the field at 100% propane. So propane for us is something we understand. It has propensity to flashback, 
right? So we understand that. And we've worked over the years to enable burning it. So now is a good time when we talk about hydrogen is to compare it to propane and see how essentially back to back it looks like. This is, I think, in my opinion, one of the most important curves to help you understand hydrogen burning regimes. So you can see that up to around, let's say 25, 30% or so, the blow of time for propane and hydrogen is very similar. So what does that mean, right? What, what does it mean? It means that most gas turbine manufacturers if you go and ask them to give you an engine that can burn 25% hydrogen, they should be able to give you that. It should not be a problem. But if you ask beyond that, it's gonna be a problem. They have to tailor something for you, right? All the way up to 80%, you see a very interesting phenomena happening. Propane is kind of leveling off, like it just levels off, it doesn't change anymore. So what does that mean? It means that if you ask for a gas turbine that runs 80% propane versus 100% propane, no much design change is required. Gas turbine manufacturer should be able to give you a solution. That's not the case for hydrogen. If they give you a solution for 80% hydrogen and you ask for 100% hydrogen, they'd have to tailor something for you. It's gonna be different. So this curve sets the foundation to the future of gas turbines burning hydrogen. There's gonna be the up to 25% range. There's gonna be between 25 to 80, and there's gonna be the beyond 80% range. Now you can look more on the impact of blow of time. And I'm just trying to, to get the message across that it's sensitive. What is your pressure? What's your temperature? What's your equivalence ratio? You have to take all that into consideration. What's your combustion architecture? Your combustor, is it a DLE machine? Is it a SAG? It's an RQL. Is it partially premixed? All that makes a huge difference. If it's partially, partially premixed, it's gonna be a huge challenge. You may not be able to burn hydrogen unless you do a significant change, right? If it's a DLE, you may be able to adjust your system if it's uh, fully non-premixed, which is kind of this region, then you may be able to handle that without a problem. So it depends, right? But all these kind of figures help you to think about the process and understand the challenges that the system will face, if you will. Now, if you take, um, do a simple reactor network model today, we can use those reactor network models to predict the natural gas NOx emissions. We are successful in doing that. So the intent here was before we go run the test, so we ran a test, I'll show you the results, but before we run the test, we wanted to see what should we expect in terms of the NOx penalty? What's gonna happen to the NOx emissions, which is heavily regulated today, right? if we go from 100% natural gas to 100% hydrogen. And the data here says, well, it depends on your firing temperature. This is this curve, it's a firing temperature kind of. And you should expect within the range of firing temperatures we run today, a 65 to 40% penalty, if you will. So going into the test, you expect to see 65 to 40% increase in NOx emissions. Let's see if this is accurate or not accurate, because we don't know. Maybe the modeling techniques cannot capture the truth, which is the case. It was not able to capture the truth. So let's check this together. We ran an experimental uh, test. As far as I know, GE is the only gas turbine manufacturer today that ran a DLE system now, mind my words, DLE system, not, not any other system, at up to 100% hydrogen. I don't think any other, any other entity did that so far. So that's what you're looking at. <clears throat> this is one of the future technologies that GE has. It's an ultra low NOx technology. This black curve, this black curve is natural gas. 
And you can see with natural gas, you get less than 10 ppm NOx. They call this ultra low NOx technologies, meaning we can get sub 10 ppm when we burn natural gas. But then look what happened. We started adding hydrogen and these dots show you what happens when the percentage was increasing, right? So, you know, you go up in 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and you keep all the way up until you kind of hit 100%. And this red curve is 100% hydrogen. So when you look at that, you can immediately have a feel of the challenge as we switch to burning hydrogen. You see a 9 ppm or a 10 ppm NOx emission going to like 130 ppm. This is huge. This is huge. This was not expected. Modeling said 50 to 65 percent, but actual data came back saying it's many, many, many folds more than what we were expecting, right? So when we, when we saw that, we started thinking, what are the handles and leverages we have to improve this and get it to be better, if you will? But one way you can interpret the results first is you can plot the percentage hydrogen versus the NOx impact. You can see that up to 20, 30%, not too much impact on NOx emissions. And then it picks up. The more hydrogen you want to burn, all the way up to 100%, the more penalty you're going to get. And this is almost 11 times more. So that's a lot, a lot more, right? Now, CO is for sure moving in the opposite direction. So this is the CO with natural gas. This is the CO with 50% hydrogen. And you can see here that this is almost um, you know, 200, 300 degrees difference in what we call turn down, this is huge, right? If you put 50% hydrogen, you can improve your turn down by 250 degrees, this is a very big number. And if you go to 100% hydrogen, your turn down is significantly increased and you don't have any CO for sure to, to compare that, uh, but it opens up to a couple more hundred degrees in terms of LBO, if you will. So, you know, what can we do, right? What can we do? So one thing you can do is make your combustor much shorter. And this is kind of what we did here, but we did it by uh, reducing the pressure drop, if you will. So we reduced the pressure drop. Um, I'm sorry, we increased the pressure drop to reduce the residence time. That was the best we can do at the time. And you can see the numbers improved significantly, right? Now you are seeing something around the 50 ppm or so not terribly bad, not terribly bad, it's about okay. Um, and then you can see everything else relative to that, including the natural gas case at short residence time. But then you see the problem, right? You do that and your natural gas burning becomes a challenge because you've shortened your combustion system and now turn down on natural gas is an issue. So what does that mean? I'm just trying to tell you that if the, Economy is asking for a machine that can burn 100% natural gas and also burn 100% hydrogen. That's not going to be an easy task. Some changes will need to happen to make this essentially possible, if you will. Um, in fact, just the 100% hydrogen by itself is, is a huge challenge that people will need to come up with ways to enable it. But this is just one way through the GE combustion technologies. And this is kind of the curve that you, for you to build the feel um, on how the NOx emissions will change as you make your combustor. Just for those who may not be understanding of the language, when I say make the combustor you know, less residence time, 5.6 versus eight, think of it as a shorter combustor. Think of it as a smaller combustor, if you will. So this is the big, long, this is the small, short, right? So this slides, gives you a feel on what combustion systems of the future will look like that will be burning hydrogen. They will essentially be smaller units. They will be compact units. There will be uh, shorter units, if you will. 
Um, this is just a little note. I'm not going to spend much time here. I'm almost almost done with my presentation. I know I'm running out of time, uh, but essentially this is just to say that the concept of NOx 15, which is NOx corrected to 15% um, oxygen, may not be the right way when hydrogen is being burned. And the reason is shown here, because your oxygen is actually different and oxygen is used to correct and it's almost as if you are penalizing emissions, actually. Like if somebody says, I'm burning hydrogen, it's almost as if you are penalizing the person who's burning hydrogen. So agencies like EPA and other agencies that regulate emissions will need to put that into consideration. Um, either maybe give some uh, window and margin to engines running high percentage hydrogen, if you will, or come up with a different strategy, if you will. But it will need to happen at some point. Um, so summary of what I went over today, right? I said that in my eyes, I think in the future, when we run out of crude oil and natural gas and all these conventional resources, uh, probably hydrogen at the time would be five to 10% of the global economy. Until then, I don't think it's gonna exceed 2%. Um, we said it's gonna be used to the most part, we predict, it's gonna be used in gas turbines and combustion systems. So we went over things like uh, blow off time, uh, flame speed. We've seen how we can split it into some different regions, 25%, 80%, 100%. We've seen how the flame speed increased like 50 times. We've spoken about modeling tools, cannot predict. So, hey, for the people here today, here's one thing you can work on. Work on improving the modeling tools. There's one thing you can do. Work on experimental data that quantifies those effects, right? We discussed that residence time is gonna be the key way in the future to make it acceptable from an NOx emission standpoint, because I showed you, if you take a system and just run it on hydrogen, um, you can get 11 times more NOx. Absolutely not acceptable, right? So there has to be a solution. We showed you one solution today, which is residence time, right? And we learned from it that the term you always listen to, people are saying zero emissions, zero emissions, zero. That's not true. That's not true. Zero carbon dioxide is okay, but not zero emissions. For zero emissions to happen, the way combustors are built today has to change. It's not gonna be zero. It's not gonna be zero NOx, no they have to change to make it at least just similar to the amount of NOx we get today. And this is just a bonus for the people who are in today. Um, I suggest three things if you are in the field of doing combustion research. Um, what is the flame length required to fully oxidize hydrogen along the gas turbine engine operating envelope? You can put five students to work on that for four years or so right, to get you all this data. Mix of configurations, pressure drop, T3, P3, what would be the flame length? You can use PIV, you can use flame luminosity, imaging techniques, you can use sampling probe techniques, you can see, and you can do like lots of important work that the industry needs to be able to come up with the future um, configurations for combustion systems, if you will. And this is another study, right, how to, enable it to run on natural gas, 100% hydrogen by using axial fuel staging, right? Multiple configurations, multiple geometries, multiple operating conditions, multiple pressure drops. In my opinion, you can put three students doing their master's or PhD work for a couple of years doing this work. The other part of it is actually modeling hydrogen blended fuels and getting NOx and CO compared to experimental data different configurations, jet flames, swirl-based flames, combination of jet-based and swirl-based flames for extended turn down, different pressure drops, different operating conditions. So these are all things that you can do in future. So that's it, you know, thank you so much. I hope I did not take uh, more time than what is intended. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, so, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Rabassan, for uh, the interesting presentation. It seems you don't see much hope in hydrogen. Uh, so, <laughs> but uh, you at least give some hope for the oil here. Uh, 
so uh, yeah uh, so let's leave her uh, if, uh, our uh, our colleagues here in the panel if uh, any have any question please uh, go ahead just have one comment please yeah sure. please do okay, please go ahead yeah thank you dr basim basim for this nice talk thanks so much uh, yeah yeah i, I just uh, i just tell my opinion in this field so the yep. problem yeah you will answer the problem is not hydrogen, it's how to produce hydrogen. Right. So, yeah, this is a problem because if we continue in our way of producing a hydrogen, like gray hydrogen, so the carbon dioxide will increase. And you cannot, you, you probably imagine if the temperature increased two degrees, you can imagine many cities will, will disappear in the world. Like most of Japan will disappear. Yeah, many cities like on, on the red, uh, like ocean, many cities, many people will die if we continue this. I'm, I'm just telling, yeah, I'm just, so the problem is how right. to produce hydrogen. This is a problem. Yeah, right. this is what, it, it seems yes, that Dr. Zaki is, 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 yeah, Dr. Bassam, if you excuse me, I, I think Dr. Bassam is also talking about in the downstream, not only production, yeah. there are some, so yeah, many. Yeah, cons consumption, yeah, after that, how to use hydrogen. Because I'm just right. telling you, because hydrogen we should we should produce because another way for ammonia synthesis, you know, without ammonia we cannot survive on this earth because ammonia for fertilizer, not for fuel. Ammonia understood, fuel, understood. Yeah, but, but uh, the understood. second I, I would like to take to take that like like so in this field we have two people work in this field, economic people and the politician, politician. So economic people don't care about anything. They care about money only. But <laughs> right. the politicians care about the people. Yeah, they should take action to stop. Are you sure? That's why. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah, yes, I'm sure because because yeah. because all all the decision comes from political, so not, yeah. not from economic. Yeah, I'm I'm sure right. of course because right. last last meeting all the president of the world gather and they take action. We have, we have to decrease the level of CO2. How right. to, uh, to decrease? Uh, yeah, because, because money is not important, uh, is important, but not, not important like our to, to, to keep the people alive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think Dr. Bassam is speaking about some technicality in, in using hydrogen in the downstream. Uh, yeah, the issue is using, using, using ammonia because I'm chemist. Ammonia also, if we use ammonia as fuel, this NOx is also a problem because it is also like CO2 gas. If we have yeah. any nitrogen, nitrogen oxide gas coming, we are talking about the mass production yeah. of ammonia. It, I yeah, think it, it will be. Uh, because in my opinion, in my opinion, just a few, just one minute more. In my opinion, because this ammonia as fuel, this uh, the professor institute this to get uh, fund from the government if we use it as fuel as new idea. But in my opinion, is not working in the future for mass production at well as fuel. But ammonia itself is very important for fertilizer. It is enough. <laughs> And yeah, I, I think I mean, when it comes to NOx emission, as it is low burning fuel, so it may not be any result in an issue, big issue when it comes to NOx emission, because it would be comparable to the already the existing engine and internal combustion engine and the gas turbines. Uh, but usually, yeah, we usually we see some limitation in given application as far no, as I, no, maybe no, this, 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 this this nitro. This nitrogen oxide gases is uh, uh, can absorb the, the the heat and the like green gas effect more than CO two more than CO two yeah, yeah 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 so yeah, uh, yeah, it will be dangerous yeah yeah for sure and let me just uh, comment a little bit on, on your just uh, uh, thank on, you on what okay. you said Dr Zohra no so sure, thank you um, I am not against hydrogen I didn't say that. I'm estimating, <laughs> I'm estimating yeah. the percentage of contribution of hydrogen in the future economy. I'm not saying yeah. let people die. I didn't say that. No, I didn't say no. that, right? No, just yeah. give me a second, give me a second. I understand, I understand, give me a second. I'm saying that energy sources, energy source, a source that will give you energy is right here. It's gonna be nuclear, it's gonna be yeah. hydro, it's gonna be wind, it's gonna be solar. So, um, I said we're gonna ramp up that. 
Today it's 1.1. I think, and I may be wrong, that's fine. But I think today it's 1.1, it's gonna grow up 15 times. This is yeah. gonna grow up 10 times. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. gonna grow up twice. In my opinion, this is gonna grow up, you know, five times. Yeah, I could be wrong, but these are energy sources. These are all clean energy sources. And we're not going to discuss about nuclear, that people agree to it or not. But in my opinion, it's a clean energy source, right? But once you have an energy source, you have to have that. If this box is not there, if this box right here is yeah. not there, then there is nothing. There's no civilization. All human beings are dead. If this is yeah, not yeah, there, yeah. we are dead. But yeah, yeah, after exactly. this is there, right? After this is there, after it happens, after it happens, then comes the question, do you make hydrogen? Do you make batteries? Do you make biodiesel? Do you make bioethanol? Do you make something else? It's gonna be the question they have to answer at the time. This is not an energy source. It's not. This yeah. is a transformation of an energy that you already generated. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah so, so, so that's it. I just hope my, picture is clear what I was trying to say. Yeah, clear. So thank you, Dr. Bassam. Yeah, okay, thank been... you, Dr. Bassam. Yeah. Uh, sure. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I comment, Dr. Vitar, Dr. Uh, I mean, just say uh, you can give us some hope on hydrogen, at least. <laughs> yeah. I, I suppose I'm interested to know what um, you and GE <laughs> think um, will be the main hydrogen storage methods in the future. Would it be, for, in particular, for aero, um, GT, aero gas turbines. Um, do you think it'd be liquid or gaseous or other? As, this is a great question. Well, thank you for asking, uh, Dr. Peter. And um, at this point in time, to be honest with you, it's, it's unknown. We are pursuing both, for example, for aircraft engine, meaning in our programs for a future layout of how an aircraft engine would be, uh, we are giving the primary path for now is essentially that it will be liquid hydrogen. But that doesn't mean that gaseous high pressurized is not on the table, but that's what we are putting up first as of now. It will be liquid. And we envision that the future, you know, most likely this is now, I'm gonna say Bassam opinion, not GE opinion, right? I wanna differentiate that, that in the future, each airport will have to have its own production on site. Yes, I understand it's gonna be terrible, it's gonna be huge, you need more space, it's gonna be more infrastructure, it's gonna be more work, it's gonna be understood. But that's most likely what's gonna enable it to happen in the future. Yeah. Every airport will have to have its own production facility where it's produced, liquefied, pumped to the aircrafts, and then they take off. Yes, yeah, at least we have Cranfield have their own airport, and I think <laughs> we're doing exactly that. But I, I do agree with you. Uh, if yeah. we think about Heathrow Airport in the UK, it's half of all flights from the UK, uh, to and from the UK, and there's no way to, to make that much hydrogen transported to, um, to the airport, it has to be produced on site, right? Mm, it's still yeah. it's a huge, huge thing to overcome in the future, yep. yeah. But Dr. Bassam, you are speaking here about liquid hydrogen for combustion burning in gas turbine for uh, jet application, or just you are talking about um, other fuel cell maybe or something? So yeah, no, good. Combustion yeah. point of view. Yep, good question. And so far, um, what we are pursuing is it will have to be vaporized. So liquefying is just for transportation. Uh, so you can carry it on an aircraft. So you imagine those big aircrafts, you have to put some hydrogen on it. So the, the vision is it's going to be liquid hydrogen, but when you burn it, it has to be in a gaseous form. So there will be a vaporizer on board on the aircraft that will vaporize, and then you will burn it to the combustion system. Yeah, yeah. So it's a burning, not fuel cell. Yeah. Yep. It's going to be burning. It's going to be burning and it's going to be gaseous burning. Right. Yeah, that's uh, that's a great I I see. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, our speaker tonight. So we really enjoyed uh, this uh, thank you. Uh, webinar. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zaki, uh, Dr. Peter, Dr. Miming, and Dr. Bassam for this insightful talk and discussion. As a matter of fact, I had a question on uh, because we are testing hydrogen for Dr. Bassam. I think the time is late already. <laughs> 
it's not only an is a time, uh, maybe the delay time, but also you, you know hydrogen flames are very close to uh, to the inlet of the combustor, to close to the holder, the flame holder. So I, I don't think we need to. Uh, yes, as you said, it, will, it should be a kind of more combat combustion chamber uh, when you handle uh, hydrogen in this case. You talk about also axial <coughs> axial stages. We are trying here. Uh, stratified we have dual <clears throat> dual flow uh, we have uh, flow is coming in uh, stratified form with dual flow dual annular counter rotating as well i think this is one of the technologies but when we apply this the flame even becomes more shorter so that means we i think when we go to the hydrogen combustion i think we may need to redesign the combustion chamber itself and also the fuel supply system uh, to the combustor and all of this so, so yeah and i think the way is very long right. for for hydrogen, but uh, we have the Hoburn hydrogen, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so here, um, yeah. so that's all, Yanni, for uh, tonight. So thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for our audience, and uh, for sure we'll be meeting in the future, inshallah. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.